was this was uh, but there are questions maybe coming emitna um yes but um, my question is very basic uh what is uh, we have to build basic the... questions are good by the way i really like basic questions and stupid questions or things like that that are like that so yeah don't feel okay. feel good for okay. us okay yes uh okay thank you uh so we are supposed to build the mobile app can you can you tell maybe in a short way what is the difference between building a web app and a mobile app i mean yeah maybe i, I would let Yididia speak and then i'll add whatever i feel is missing uh, okay so i think uh okay on current technologies we can also build mobile apps using web apps and just turn them into progressive web apps so uh, one can just build a responsive web app and then uh, use that as a mobile application but here we uh, what we need is a mobile application that a user won't have to go to a website then access the application but rather they can just access the uh, the implementation of the smart contract using their mobile application. So it's going to be uh, one of the tasks is just to continuously listen for the user's location at a specified time. So maybe let's say at midnight or in the morning, the smart contract or the mobile application will be able to fetch the user's location on the background without notifying the user. And that will access the data, the user's data and uh, check if that user complies with the agreement or not. So we, the user don't have to, doesn't have to go to a website or web application and access the application, but his, the mobile application will uh, by itself be accessing the user's location. Yeah, and, and just to add, I think Emitran, if I understood the question also, you are asking the difference between mobile app and mobile D app, right? Um, Is that the case? Uh, yes, in a sense. Uh, uh, yes, also, like, uh, I mean, we... Okay. we, yeah, so we like your second question is yeah. on... So, what basically, it's also the authorization. So, for example, in a normal um, app, you're basically authenticating. It's basically what makes usually D in the, in you know, what makes D uh, in the app, or D app, or mobile D app, or web, you know, web D app, I don't know, whatever, D apps instead of just app you know is that ability the background the back end the authentication and all of that is also a kind of based on blockchain right so based on distributed that basically d means distributed so in a way that you're when you are authorizing to do for example transaction you might attach a wallet and that wallet it's basically needs permission to happen and it's it's basically communicating with with the blockchain and the same is also the back end is implemented through a blockchain so it's distributed i mean so basically the logic is implemented in the in a the, in the blockchain that usually makes add d on the app right if everything was done of course without without including blockchain then you would say that's an app right so either a mobile app or a web app does that clarify or ask until it fits in your head uh, yeah, so the difference here is in the back end, is it? Um, I mean, compare or comparing um, a D app and um, a normal app. Yes, the logic, basically, the logic is done in the back and, and basically in the blockchain. So in this case, for example, what is the logic? The logic is that a user is able, there is a predefined contrast that is living in the blockchain that says you know that that really the 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 owner of that phone and to whom the the owner has a deal with in this case let's say an employee so an employer and then the user with the phone being the employee now they have a contract and that contract is not a third party human or a system but much more a blockchain on, on which they have agreed what to do and you know when payment for example will happen right so that is written in a contract and a predefined just like the normal contracts of course it's written in a contract 
the the executor or the implementer or the enforcer of that contract is a blockchain right because now you are sending to that blockchain the blockchain receives um a message because in the blockchain that you have you know you have put the the smart contract the smart contract expects is run by when it's initiated through a data that data is basically comes from the phone in this case right and then you know the that that smart contract is accessed by an API, an api right and then just you send to it and then that api then has a logic in it it runs based on its input it runs and then does something and then it probably will pay or accumulates to pay you know and so that that basically everything the logic the actual thing that is why you are writing the app itself is because that there is a logic that logic is implemented in the blockchain so if you think of it now the d is that just that the logic is distributed even if you take the you know the mobile app down the logic is still there if you send it and somehow it, impl it, it is implemented right so the mobile app is exposing that logic or basically acts as as an actor to that you know um, that logic and that logic is a distributed in blockchain lives in the distributed manner in a blockchain does that make sense does that explain uh yeah i think i think i yeah, i get the basic idea so the app uh, the mobile app should be working in the background basically collecting the um, location data or sending it at uh, specific intervals maybe and uh, this information is sent back to through the to the api which implements the logic where um i mean the smart contract log yeah. is basically so used to how yeah yeah how you implement you know just in a normal api let's say you're writing a flask server and you run a flask server which is exposed in http gate or post right and then that http post and gate would just do it and answer to you like whatever now in this case the api is it's basically the blockchain is really exposing the, that's called the smart contract api that's basically acts like as a function that you send to it you call it it's like another transaction you know because it everything in the blockchain is a type of transaction and you send the transaction and in in the case of of course um, um in the case of ethereum the first initiation of messaging transaction happens by a user a certain user and then just that calls the smart contract and therefore and that means the the, the phone must have a user id but basically um, you know will be a user in this case a phone which represents the person will be will have um basically an address and that address is the initiator basically sends to this blockchain smart contract it, on its address the transaction and then the transaction is sealed or that means um authenticated or basically through the you know the private key of the user or in this case just the phone right it's right and then it sends that transaction when that the transaction starts the computation of the smart contract and you know things happen in the blockchain so that's what's the dr is that does that is that clear or ask it until again fits in your head uh I, it's clearer um i probably have questions more when it comes to the actual um in building but yeah, yeah yeah but i mean sure the, there are questions in the building you know what how things work but as long as it fits in your head the overall picture and you know yes sure you might not understand what does this api thing for the smart contract you know but if you think of it just the three terminologies that i'm using are transactions you know transactions they just like in, in any bank transaction you go and you start a transaction right you just write your phone if it's a mobile money you happen to just say okay i do this your first login authenticates it and then you say send money to the transaction and the bank processes that transaction and completes that transaction so that's what 
blockchain language is transaction, right? Just everything, everything in the blockchain starts by it, you know, done in one or another form of transaction. So and even then, the smart contract is a transaction, you're saying? The smart contract is created by a transaction. And then the smart contract is initiated, API call is a transaction. It just basically, you know, it's a transaction. You start a transaction, basically. And the input of the transaction, in this case, if it was a transaction to send money, Ethereum from one user to another, the content basically becomes the amount of Ethereum you are sending. In the smart contract sense, because you are not sending, it, it, it of course, an amount that you want to send to that contract. That's also possible, but also it can have a GPS core because that's input of also the smart contract. So the smart contract can have multiple other things as an input. And then you send it that input, you then basically, that input is sent through a transaction. Just like, just like you start a bank transaction. And smart, that transaction starts the computation of the smart contract. And the smart contract processes its logic and the end project is also, if it's doing anything, if it's transferring money, it does transaction as well. So everything, basically the language is transaction, communication between anything is transaction, but depending on what the receiver, you know, who's listening beside that transaction, who's sending, that's the difference. But it's just all transactions. And the mobile app is really another note that starts that basically a user with with its own uh, Ethereum account number, you know, address that starts a transaction. And, okay. Yeah. yeah. And also the the employee and the employer is also another note that basically is uh, it has its Ethereum account number or address, and then it, it also is part of that transaction. And if this in the smart contract, it might have been decided that such that from that account, you take some money and you give it to another account, um, just based on the transaction, you know, based on what happens. So the smart contract implements that logic. It's basically your arbiter in this decentralized manner. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Great. And I see someone has also question in text. So it's Yishak. Another basically, are we getting the user location from the IP address of or location utility or from the user's cell phone? Uh, because if you, no, it is, it's not from the IP. It's not the, the, the GPS coordinate of the phone. The phone must have a GPS uh, sensor, right? And it does get just the GPS coordinate of the phone's location. Because what we want to build is we want to enforce a certain way, like the person with that phone. A person, of course, could have like, could leave the phone in that location. And always it reads the same, you know, um, the same GPS coordinate in sense. And it's a smart contract must, must also ensure that, that that shouldn't happen, right? If it's in... The, if the person wants to cheat, they can actually put in, they tie their phone on the dog and the dog moves around that area and the person can be another place. It's fine. You know? So, and it is your logic, how you then handle, because then you have to now, the smart contract must now enable or in the phone before you send, I mean, but basically just, you must then allow, you must write a test. That is not the case. Or if that is the case, it's disqualified as well. So basically, you know, if it's tied in a dog and the dog runs and the speed of a dog is very different than, you know, the, the, the person. So you can actually also correct for that. So the smart contract can get more complex and complex, ensuring different sets. But also you have to know a smart contract which is complex and runs lots of operations, also, of course, costs a lot. So it's a cost, whatever, also optimization. But does that answer your question, Isak? But it's actually we're getting from this, the GPS of this, the phone, the address.
Yeah, but it's like that's what they agreed in the first place. Right? This is a contract that they signed. The person, the employer and the employee agreed to get paid based on that. So, you know, you call, you call it user privacy only when the person doesn't agree. But we all give our privacy for to get paid, including our, you know, our bank accounts to someone to pay us or our age and our information for that. So mm -hmm. th that, of course, how you handle the data is the, the privacy issue, but the privacy is used to, to get paid. So, I mean, so it's, it's okay. We call it only just that is then how is it stored, but it's, it's stored in a secure way. So it's okay. Uh, yeah. And also, yes, start up, I think even in, when using any type of location service in any type of mobile application tool, they need to agree to, uh, then the application will uh, request them to access, to access location from their mobile application. So unless they agree, the application won't be able to access their location. So it's something that they agree yeah, when, exactly. yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Exactly that. Okay. Anything else? Any question? Things not clear? Uh, Jenna Rosa? Yeah. Um, hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey. What is the difference between an Ethereum virtual machine and the Ethereum network? Okay. Great. Uh, so maybe do you want to answer uh, so that one as well? Uh, yeah, sure. So the EVM is what will compile your code. So every uh, every code in the smart contract is compiled using the EVM, and that's what compiles your code and makes it executable. But the networks are the different networks are available in the Ethereum network, and that might be the test need somehow similar to the Algorand in the test net in, on the minute, but here we have several networks. Some of them are under, uh, they are already deprecated, but we have several networks that are uh, available that we can test on the test net and also on the minute. So the test net and the minute are the type of network that the transaction happens, but the AVM is something that will compile our code. Uh, and does the EVM work on the network? Does it run on the network? Uh, I think the, the network will use the EVM. Every transaction that's happening on the on the not on the different networks will be compiled down. So uh, just by to the give EVM. more also, the EVM runs on a node. So, like yes. the if you think of that, a network is made up of nodes, right? So the network itself is, it can be a test net, it can be, you know, the main net, and then there are multiple, multiple test nets that implement different things, right? So now each of them have a node. So, you know, a network basically is made up of node. Now the node runs, like the distribution is in the node. The node, a full node contains everything. So that means if you kill one node, the other node really has everything. That's what its blockchain is. That means it's really fully distributed and and therefore you know decentralized and distributed that's what it means now a node has it's basically you know just like ethereum or algorand it's a software in some way a node is basically has a software that basically a node means it can be one computer you know it's like that or a, or a multiple computers to be stored as as one node or a cloud right so you, you have like one node that basically runs the entire software and owned by, you know, one person or an organization. And then it has ability. So that software in that software is the virtual machine, the EVM, right? And that one runs. So now the assignment of which node runs, we talked about last time as well. It's just basically the miners. Like if it's a proof of work or if it's a proof of consensus, they do something in that node, they mine and then they send the result the network accepts or rejects the consensus happens also in the network but the actual computation of then when you when you call like an api 
to access the, for example, a smart contract. The smart contract, we, we say it is running in, the, in an EVM, EVM runs in a node. You're basically accessing, like you need it, you need one node to call such that you can run the EVM, like you can run the smart contract. So that's where the details comes in. You need, you need either, you know, you need basically a node or that, that, that runs your smart contract. So that's how it's basically implemented. But your transaction goes on probably in this transaction cloud, or that means set of transactions, and then someone collects them and then runs them and then puts them in a block. So that's how, you know, earlier Kibat when he explains about that, then you form a block and then, and, and that, that block is a set of transactions. Um, and then the miner is basically a node. So, and then in the node is an EV. Right. So is that, is that clear? But this is, your, your question is very good question. It, it touched lots of elements. So if it's not clear, ask it. Or anyone else, if it's not clear, you can ask it. Uh, no, it's clear, it's clear for me. Thank you. Any other question or any other, you know, thing that's not clear or are we ready and set to start? So I assume that that one is the, yeah, Brahan. Okay, good morning. Good afternoon, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I joined late, uh, just I get some points on the smart contract in the Ethereum. But uh, if you have uh, time, just can you, what is the agreement between the employee and the employer? I didn't get that. If the, uh, the agreement, what kind of agreement they did on the, between the two parties? Because there is no third party. There is agreement that uh, from the mobile uh, to fetch the address of the employees. So uh, if you have uh, just to no, no, no. Good question. clear yeah. more. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so Thank you. the agreement is that, um, of course, that one party will pay or, you know, will do something. Let's imagine in this case, will pay the employee, employer will pay the employee if the employee, which is represented by its phone and its phone location, because we assume the phone will be in, any, in, in his or her pocket, that if the, the, the coordinates that is sent by the phone, if it is within a certain area, then for a certain period, then the employer will agree to pay this person, right? And that one, they then ask it, you know, uh, uh, a Web3 developer to write a smart contract because in the past, what would they do? They go to a lawyer to, to sign and then they will be like, you know, someplace now they want to be modern so they just say great we agreed on this one now i will install you know this this mobile app and then i will i agree to basically of course send and if it's not sent because of some reason because i'm not in a network whatever it's my fault right so the, but that's basically it's pre-specified in some way but you know you don't need to write it it's basically that's what they agreed but now the agreement of the money payment which usually is the key component is written in the smart contract by saying like, okay, you know, you're basically the coder codes this logic as part of the smart contract. What do they do? They just basically say like, okay, they expose a smart contract that receives as an input the GPS coordinates for a certain address, because that's authentication, that it must be for a particular phone address, right? Be, you know, that not phone address, but that phone has basically uh, an account in the Ethereum. So it has an Ethereum address. And then that's why it's able, basically, it's able to then authenticate or to send transaction. By that transaction, we mean send the input, the GPS coordinate to the smart contract. Smart contract takes that one, proceeds, great, past, 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 because past means for the smart contract, it is basically means um, that it does, it does the, the it, it computes the GPS coordinates and then co compares it whether it's within a certain range. And then it is with a certain time. Yes, if that is the case, yes. Then it, it says pass until it breaks. Now, after some time, when everything is passed, for example, then 
great. The smart contract already inside it has a code just to dispense money to that person. And note that that person doesn't mean the phone itself, but it could be another Ethereum address that the person owns. It could be, you know, whatever. So then it sends money to that. Then it's completed. That's that's agreement. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Yeah, thank you. It's, it's more clear. Thank you. Okay, great. And then, so how are we going to the EVM? Does Docker is necessary? Uh, maybe just uh, Yididia just can answer like on this one. Uh, no, no, it's not. Uh, we can. Uh, we have different API endpoints that we can interact in Docker and other setup that we use Donald Grant isn't necessary. So the, yeah, I think the simple answer is that it is actually runs on a node and you don't run the node yourself, right? EVM runs on a node. You basically call an, an API, which is exposing you to a node. So you are not you know, you are basically building the solution. So if you were to run the blockchain node yourself, of course, then you have to run a node. In that case, you have to basically, yeah, not only run, just you have to run the entire, either of, it's called light node or full node, you can run that one of them of your choice. But that's optional in the blockchain since you don't have to run to use it. You can just access any node in them that's exposed. So in this case, you're going to use API. You're not going to run. So you're only just creating, writing the contract, creating the front ends and, and then, and connecting them. And you know, that all just those the pieces. Okay. I hope that's clear. If not, you can ask or you can talk. Adiat. Um, just to get more understanding of the, of this week's challenge, I'd like to know what, um, real life application of this of the mechanism of the smart contract is what what kind what kind of uh, relationship will be between the employer and the user that will make them want to pay someone for saying in a particular position? I mean you can uh, so you mean the real life case right yes yeah so one one I think already uh, Haile Mikhail in his first uh, you know description of understanding he mentioned it it could basically be uh like you have a gatekeeper you know someone that is a security guard right oh. and let's imagine that and you want them to pay as long as at night that person is within a certain location another one is that refund like for example if, if you are an employee and uh, an employer and then your employee goes to a meeting, a workshop in a certain city. You know, you want to be able to only reimburse them for the hotel and everything if they if they are there. Another one is a construction worker that basically is working and you want them to be in a certain place and having a certain activity. So there are so many, many cases. Anyone else? Okay, hopefully it's all clear. So that what I will do is that, okay, now we have gone into the overview. I think this is very clear by now. And we have all this that we know. And basically the instructions you can read, I think there's nothing. It's just that there are different uh, development environments for uh, Ethereum. In Algorand, you have used the sandbox, blah, blah, blah. So that's just for Algorand. When you come to Ethereum, uh, you would use some other environment. And Brownie is Python driven, and Hardart and Truffle are basically um, JavaScript driven. Now, you basically can have different examples. You will have, we will give you, just because you have one day less, the, the final submission is going to be on, for, on Saturday. So, we we get into our normal uh, routine so because of that what we would give you is that uh, we would give you a starter code for the mobile app as well as the web app from previous like selected ones and then you can build on top of them 
right? You can improve them and, and make more features. So you spend more time on building, actually, on updating and compiling the apps. Of course, you have to compile and whatever, but uh, the codes, whatever, just the, the part we would be able to provide you, a starter code, and then you would build a smart contract, connect them, you know, basically deploy them, all of that you do. And to deploy them, you need this, of course, this development environments. You choose, you know, we, it's like, if you are very much into uh, JavaScript, I would say just choose hard art or truthful. You would just, when you read the reference, you would, if you are into Python, you can just do uh, that one, um, Browning. And basically after that, you write, you know, you analyze it, just you, you read a little bit about, actually most in, in, uh, jobs for Web3 development really is about security. That means because it's you write it only once and then you can't change it, which really means you really, the smart contract, especially, you know, if you are dealing with millions of dollars, you really don't want to be hacked, right? So it's about make, ensuring that, you know, that users can't hack it or that it's secure is the main, 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 main uh, job openings. So you just attempt also security analysis for your own for the smart contract. And here is just the task one, and there will be a number of, you know, smart two. Uh, task two is just uh, how do you write smart contract? You have to learn basically solidity or um, similar to actually be able to, it's, it's called Web3 uh, yeah, Python one, but like, let's say solidity, you really just, um, and then you will learn that language, it's simple, and you'd be able to build. Uh, sorry, Abobal, I had a question. I, I couldn't see that, so go on. Uh, my question was, you you mentioned that you'll provide a starter code for the mobile app, so is the starter code just uh, native Android, or is it going to be for a specific framework? So, yeah, we, hopefully, I'm, I'm not clear on that one, Azaria, if, they, if he's here, like he would tell you, but what we would have, what we know is that there is a React Native, and then uh, also, uh, what is the other one? Uh, Flutter. Uh, Flutter. And then, do we have also Android Studio? I'm not sure. Mm, I don't think we have, but we'll try to yeah. look. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so, but at least for the two frameworks we do. If you choose another one, uh, you can, you know, maybe it's just we don't have that. But the start code would be for the two frameworks. Yeah, does that answer? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, and then the task three, which is normally, which is about building, you basically, let's say, if you are comfortable that you basically extend it, and if not, you would be, um, yeah, you would basically write something um, that works. Um, and then basically you, be, you will test and deploy this thing, right? So that's just simple. There are, uh, by simple, I mean, I hope it's clear to understand. And tomorrow, today, the tutorials in the afternoon will be, you know, a lot more Azaria and uh, Nardos would demystify by writing, by showing you, by taking you remixes, a web-based a web editor. That's from actually the Ethereum Foundation. A, you know, just a hands-on code on writing different types of smart contract using Solidity, very simple ones, but just to get you don't come out of today's tutorial. We arranged uh, uh, an extended one because we want you just to get to get the feeling, right? All that. Don't come out of that one without knowing. Okay, the the basics of writing and writing a smart contract and, re, and a remix. It's just a web. You don't need to set up anything. It's just a web browser. Okay. So really prepare yourself for that, and then tomorrow there will be um, basically a smart contract, just particularly. But then a lot more is on the QA and tutors with tutors. Um, you know, Nardos and Nididia, at least, and others have attempted. I'm not sure how much, but Nardos and Nididia have built this thing, and so they can ask them any question, and that would be, you know, it's easier. So just, you know, overwhelm them if you want. And then about, so we would then on Thursday, on those, the starter codes, we would have Nididia would lead the Thursday one on mobile app um, and the app, um, web app, uh, basically development for for this. And we also would invite batch five trainees from whom we take 
at the starter coach to actually actually also take you through their coach um, and that's, that's it and submission is thursday for um thursday just uh, the entry and then saturday the final okay so it's not sunday sunday you would so we'll, we'll next week we'll turn into the usual rhythm and yeah so there are references here on examples of mobile apps examples of the app you know all, all of that so you can read that hopefully that clarifies is there any outstanding outstanding question or i think roughly clear for now hopefully it's clear for now if you have questions you know you can ask but yeah try try it it's exciting and so yeah good luck thanks guys in academy we can stop ah patrick patrick has a question yeah go on patrick. hey uh, good afternoon good afternoon uh, I, I was trying to ask if it's if it is possible that we can um, submit by by sunday and then attend the the next uh week by uh, start the next week by monday as you but I mean, if you if you want, like for you, we we can take the exception for that. But in general, I oh, want no. people to rest because the thing is, we want one day to to a break. So, but if you have a situation and you want to do that, I think we can we can do some exceptions. But as a general rule, we want really one day. We don't want to go directly to um, to Monday continuous because then that means you know people will be uh, slightly burned out but if you have a, you know if you if you just feel you need that and you can handle it and you know you want it you can just write it to me you know to the t-force and we would take that special case if there are some special case requests we can take but as a general let's just if you don't write us we expect um, on saturday yeah, is that reasonable and okay? Yeah, that's reasonable. Okay. Great. Great. I like also the participation now, so keep up this this energy.